For the next speaker is, um, I would like to welcome Dr. Doug Gurion Sherman. Um, he holds a doctorate in plant pathology from the University of California, Berkeley. He's a consultant on agriculture with strategic expansion and training in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, he has recently advised civil society coalitions and organizations in the US and Europe on issues of climate change and agriculture, pesticide alternatives, and genetic engineering. He's also an honorary research fellow with the Center of Agroecology, Water, and Resilience at Coventry University. Prior to his current position, he worked as a senior scientist for nearly two decades with the US NGOs, including the Union of Concerned Scientists and the Center for Food Safety. Um, his recent work includes co-authorship of a proposed platform for food and agriculture in the Green New Deal. So I'd like to welcome Doug to the stage. You have 30 minutes. Okay, um, so I, I want to thank Ricarda for an excellent introduction, which will help me a little bit. Um, so I'm going to focus on applications. Um, we have a lot to go through, uh, so I apologize ahead of time if I go through the slides a little bit quickly. Um, I'm not going to focus on the um, technology per se. Um, my training is uh, very much in molecular biology, but Ricardo did an excellent job, I think, laying out how the technology works and its limitations and so forth. So I'm going to go through a number of the applications. Um, and uh, as well, uh, those, you know, as Ricardo said, and we hope you um, read the, the report that will give the literature support for many of the things that all of us are talking about, but in my case, for the um, issues that I'm bringing up here in really a, um, uh, obviously, an overview uh, way, and uh, a lot more information, as you might expect, is, is in the report along with, with support. Um, and I also want to thank my co-authors. So this is um, the second chapter of our report, and uh, much of the work was done by others. Um, and uh, um, my part of that was, was much more a focus on agriculture systems. So I'll probably put a little more emphasis on that. Um, um, rather than some of the medical applications, but I will try to do justice to the work that others uh, put into this as well. Uh, so in, in evaluating gene drives, uh, some of this Ricarda uh, already went over, um, so I'll kind of go through it quickly, but um, I think one of the points we want to make is that, um, as Ricarda said, we're talking about complex systems, and this is not just a matter of complicated systems. In um, population ecology, for ex example, complex systems are defined in part as those that are, are very difficult to, to predict. Um, and uh, so that's part of the context. Um, we want to also talk about the, the public health concerns as well. But I also want to bring in a little bit here some of the social context, because that is another complex system. And also, um, the, the development of any technology um, depends on its social context. Um, and so we, we have, as Ricardo said earlier, an interaction of several quite complicated or complex systems, which makes the outcome um, of, of uh, the effects of gene drives um, very hard to predict. We would, uh, I think, probably all agree, um, especially at this stage, um, largely unpredictable. Um, Ricardo also went through several of the um, aspects of, uh, of gene drive organisms that make them different. Uh, some of these can be found in natural systems. Uh, Ricardo talked about transposable elements, um, which um, predecessors going back to Richard Dawkins and others called selfish genes and have the ability to, to be um, what we would call not traditionally Mende Mendelian. Um, and especially, um, I want to emphasize uh, that um, do not need to have a positive fitness benefit um, in order to spread through, uh, through the population, which is um, different than, than most, well, I would say different than any uh, previous genetically engineered organisms. Um, there was the possibility that we could have outcrossing from crops. Uh, we know that that happens more than we used to think it did um, from crop plants into the wild relatives. But those would require positive fitness to spread through the environment. And we also have to remember that fitness is a, com a complicated or complex topic as well. An organism can be fit 
um, or a gene can provide positive fitness in certain environmental contexts, but not others. So, and part of the range of an organism, let's say a wild species that could hybridize with a crop, um, a particular gene might provide positive fitness, but in other parts of its range and other, um, other environments, it would not. So these would all tend to be um, more self-limiting than at least the potential of gene drives um, can uh, provide. Um, these are, again, some basic considerations of the environment that uh, Ricardo be began to, to touch on, but um, predator-prey relationships, uh, nutrient cycling, effect on pollination, species, species uh, composition. Um, these are all you know, examples in the literature where we have some indication that um, alteration or suppression of a population of target organisms could affect. And again, um, as I'll get into further, we have, unfortunately, very little information, very little data or research um, at this point that could tell us um, how, how these effects uh, may spread through, through the environment. Um, some of these effects can be indirect, um, so they could be removed by several generations or trophic level effects removed uh, by several species in a food web, for example. Um, and again, so, um, you know, very hard to predict where and how, how big the, the effects in the environment will be. Um, okay. Um, another important um, concept that, that Ricarda touched on is that um, virtually all of these organisms have short generation times and reproduce fairly quickly. And that, you know, is a limitation, at least currently, on the kinds of organisms that uh, we could think about using gene drives in, but it also often means that they will spread, the genes will spread um, in, in uh, evolutionary time or geological time um, relatively rapidly. Many of the organisms are fairly mobile, and those add complications in practice to containing gene drives as well as the uh, molecular challenges that Ricarda talked about. Um, in, in terms of public health, we have some general concepts, and again, I'm not trying to be comprehensive here, but just touch on a few. Um, niche replacement, uh, so for example, if um, a particular uh, mosquito that carries a disease um, is suppressed or the ability to carry the parasite is suppressed, um, there are many other species of mosquito that are capable of carrying diseases. Could they fill the vacuum left by the species that is um, uh, suppressed or that um, uh, is lost. Uh, rebound effects, um, as Ricardo mentioned, you can have resistance developing. It can develop more or less slowly over time. Um, and the um, other aspects of the, of the ecosystem that are uh, affected by the presence or loss of that organism um, can adapt and then when the organism comes back quickly or slowly, when it, over, when it becomes resi resistant to the gene drive, um, that can kind of um, provide a shock potentially to, in, in terms of public health, for example, um, acquired immunity to a disease and so forth. Um, and that, again, is another real problem. Um, opportunity costs are something that, that we haven't talked about, but again, those are, uh, can be social issues where investment in a particular technology can preclude um, or uh, uh, have a negative effect on potential alternatives to that technology. And I'll get into that um, somewhat more in the context of agricultural issues where, where um, the commercial aspect, I think, can play a very big role. But other um, in conservation um, uh, applications or public health applications, um, that could also, these opportunities costs can apply. And these are rarely considered, never really considered in risk assessment. Uh, but again, they're part of our social fabric and they're real and they have huge implications in terms of the direction we go in terms of the way we address any of the problems that gene drives are intended to uh, look at. Um, there's basic social concerns that we haven't talked about. Equity issues, um, who decides? fundamental democracy in terms of who's at the table and who has actual power to make decisions on how these are used. Many you know, gene drives could spread across political boundaries. How are we going to address that? Um, you know, we have the, um, some international protocols, but none of them are ac um, adequate to address these problems, and they're super hard challenges to, to, to work. Um, 
Another systems level effect is um, what we might call lock-in or lock-out or path dependency. Social scientists study this, and it's basically um, that you have an infrastructure uh, that supports a certain way of addressing a problem in public health, in agriculture, the industrial system, which I'll talk about a little bit more, is very entrenched. It's entrenched by the, um, in the investments in research, in culture, um, in the science that's done or not done um, that supports it. And um, a technology may reinforce a particular direction in society or go against it. And um, I'll talk again about how um, at least the potential for gene drives is to lock in um, uh, current systems, for example, in agriculture. And I'm using, I'll use agriculture a little bit more as kind of a, a general um, argument that could be applied to public health as well. Okay, so let's get into some of the specific applications. Uh, mosquitoes, um, as I'm sure everyone knows, are probably the single major vector of many diseases, malaria, dengue, fever, and uh, many others. Um, they're approximately, um, as far as we know, about 160 to 190 species that carry pathogens. And again, if we, how are we going to approach them? Um, there are several major um, species that are, uh, uh, such as uh, Anopheles uh, gambii or um, some of the um, uh, Egypti um, uh, um, Aedes species and others. Kulix and others that are uh, major uh, carriers of disease, but there are many others that, again, might fill the niche of um, the loss of any one of these species. So where do we draw lines? And the farther we go, the higher the potential um, and the more species that we either try to suppress um, or, or otherwise modify, um, the more um, potential we may have to cause environmental harm or public health harm that is, that is unintended. Um, there are also over 3,500 species uh, of mosquitoes. And in many of these cases, so uh, within the Anopheles uh, uh, Gambi complex, um, we know many of them can interbreed. Ricardo talked about uh, gene transfer. Um, and all, virtually all of the species, all of the examples that we know or can talk about, um, hybridization can occur, and that can potentially transfer the gene. Again, as Ricardo pointed out, if we're talking about genes that are highly conserved, um, the possibility that the gene drive will function in other closely related species is increased, and that, again, can dramatically extend how far the gene drive could spread through not only the population of the target species, but other species geographically and in terms of environmental impact. Um, I also have listed some of the, um, the known in, in, um, ecological roles of mosquitoes, um, but again, there's not nearly enough known about any of this that is um, uh, to make us feel comfortable that we know enough about any single species and what the impact might be. Um, again, ecosystem roles. Um, the larvae are, um, oops. Uh, the larvae can be preyed upon by many species and for some of them can be very important in terms of food sources. Um, and con uh, conversely, the, the larvae, uh, for example, can feed on uh, microorganisms and affect the, um, the, the ecosystem by transferring energy, essentially, on uh, higher trophic levels from these smaller microorganisms through the larvae to larger organisms. And um, the f effect on smaller organisms um, can also have uh, nutrient level effects in, in the water. So again, uh, very complex interactions. Some of these species can be very dependent um, uh, from the little we know on mosquitoes. Um, the adults similarly um, have, uh, are uh, prey for uh, lots of different, um, especially um, avian species, and uh, can uh, affect uh, pollination, other organisms through, uh, through their role uh, below them in the food, uh, food webs. So one example, and, and this again, it's an illustration of concern, but it's also an illustration of how little we actually know at this point. Um, in terms of one ecological effect, um, <coughs> um, use of uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, um, it's a microorganism that is somewhat specific um, in terms of uh, the target uh, species that it will affect. 
Um, and so there have been some experiments that were um, locally, these were done in France, uh, mosquito larva populations and, and consequently adult populations were, were suppressed using this technique by applying this to the, the water and killing um, larvae. Um, it's a little bit of a blunt instrument because it will also kill um, other diptera, other fly species, especially midges, which are also fairly abundant. But it does give us an, an, um, an inclin uh, some uh, indication of the effect that suppressing these populations could have. Now, these are not necessarily disease producing uh, or carrying mosquitoes. But again, this is some of the best in, you know, data that we have. But reduction in martens, which are very important for suppressing flying pests in addition to mosquitoes, but their numbers were were uh, significantly uh, suppressed in these experiments over several years. Uh, similarly, in some similar experiments by the same group of scientists, um, these experiments showed dramatic reductions in um, dragonflies and damselflies. Um, these are, again, very important species for controlling pests. Um, fly, um, and if they're reduced by not having mosquito sources, that means they're also not there in as many numbers to control other flying uh, insects. And again, the disruptions to ecosystems um, are largely unknown. Uh, again, this is, this is just uh, another illustration. I mean, really the bottom line is here of some of the, the different groups of mosquitoes, uh, disease carrying species, numbers of total species and so forth, um, and where there's been some um, initial work in, uh, in, in gene drives, uh, in creating gene drives. Um, again, this is, um, I'll kind of skip over this slide since I'm pretty short um, on time, but, but basically what this is basically illustrating is a number of different ways that we can have rebound effects or, um, uh, let's, see, let's see, I'm just kind of orienting myself to the slide, um, no effect or, or suppression um, and everything kind of in between depending on resistance developing and so forth. Um, again, illustrating that we can have a whole range of different effects that can happen over different periods of time and different geographic um, extent. Uh, again, just a little bit more on some of these effects. Um, elimination could uh, reduce in replacement of an empty niche, which I mentioned earlier, um, or potential rebounds of effects, for example, um, this has been seen, again, not due to gene drives because we don't have any actual examples, but um, there's, adults will acquire a certain amount of immunity to malaria. Uh, this is, of course, not to minimize disease. It's a horrible disease that we need to address and, and to continue to try to address. Um, but, it, but it is possible if you re suppressed a species, re resistance occurred, and then it rebounded, you could have a potential effects of um, loss of acquired immunity which could be, could be potentially catastrophic. Uh, we need to consider alternatives. Um, vac vaccines, I don't want to minimize any of these. Vaccines are difficult. Um, people have been working on malaria vaccines in particular for a long time, but there has been some uh, progress in recent years. Um, I won't go through these in detail, but um, they're all potential areas that need more attention. Um, the mouse is another gene drive target. Um, it originated in India, but is now uh, pretty ubiquitous in most parts of the world. It's probably the most widely spread um, uh, mammal on the planet at this point. Um, it can be, a, uh, and it's very adaptable, it's an omnivore. Um, it can be um, an invasive species, but I think one important point here, and it's a, partly a philosophical point, is how we think of invasive species. If they've been, the environment was altered maybe decades or even centuries ago, um, and for example, if mice have replaced um, other species that would have filled similar niches, and those species are either gone or, or almost gone, what happens now if we eliminate mice in any given area, um, any given geographic area, um, where uh, many predators are either more or less dependent on them as food sources? Um, we don't know. Again, very little um, eco uh, good ecological resource. And then mice as well have complex interactions with other organisms that they feed on. Uh, so again, this is just a summary of some of the potential um, ecological concerns, uh, the predator-prey relationships, um, 
spread of gene drives into other related species. Um, in, in, in this case, um, there are other mouse species uh, in, the, in the genus Musculus, um, that some of which we do know have some positive roles, such as in the Western Mediterranean, the dispersal of um, oak, of acorns, which help establish um, oak savannas and, and oak forests. Um, again, as um, Ricardo mentioned, uh, the presence of, the continuing presence of CRISPR, Cas9, even if resistance occurs, um, can potentially cause off-site cutting with, with unknown effects to the environment and uh, rebound effects. Some of these, as you, as, you pro as you see, are themes that come up again and again with various applications. Um, some alternatives for controlling mice. Um, toxicants have had some success on smaller islands. Um, some recent ecologically based um, uh, approaches, uh, self-resetting traps. Um, so there, there is a work in potentially addressing some of these issues in other ways. Um, switching to, to um, agriculture and to plants, uh, Palmer amaranth is one of the biggest weed uh, problems now in the US. But I think it's a tremendous example of how a system has caused a problem and if we don't uh, take systems-based approaches, as opposed to a piecemeal kind of approach to a specific problem that gene drives try to address, uh, we don't really get at the underlying causes of the problem. Um, it's basically, and I'll get into this a little bit more, um, a dysfunctional industrial agriculture system that even made this weed, which is now probably the most important weed in major crops like soybean and cotton in the US, and to a lesser extent, uh, maize, um, it's probably the single biggest weed problem in the U.S. now. It was not before. I'll get into that a little bit more. It's also important, as been indicated, that outside of agriculture or outside of the invasive, invasive system that is being that we're trying to address, these organisms do have um, roles. Weeds are only weeds where we don't want those plants. And Palmer amaranth, in particular, has some very interesting properties that make it potentially important ecologically. One is it's very fast growing. It's, it's uh, drought tolerant. It's what's called a C4. It has C4 metabolism, um, uh, which I don't really have time to get into. But very relatively, while it's a C4 metabolism is a very efficient kind of photosynthesis, um, it's fairly common in monocots, such as maize or sorghum, in terms of agricultural plants, and many other uh, monocotyledonous plants. It's actually pretty rare in dicots, and amaranth is a dicot, so it's of interest for that. It's a source of food, it produces numerous seeds, very high nutritional value in both the seeds and the foliage. It's often used by indigenous people um, as a food source. In Africa, related species are often a very um, important source of minerals and uh, vegetable matter outside of the crop. There are crop species um, of amaranth and related uh, plants that are important crops as well. And uh, these could be um, uh, potential sources of genes for those crops or um, could be um, potentially uh, new, uh, new agriculture species. So what are um, some of the proposed uh, gene drive for population suppress, uh, suppression or herbicide um, to re uh, resensitize weeds so that the herbicide that was used to control them in genetically engineered crops could then be functional again? Uh, so those are two, two of the main applications that have been talked about for um, uh, 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 using gene drives in Palmer amaranth. Um, population suppression uh, could impact the ecological role, which again, we don't know enough about. This plant originated in the US Southwest in very dry areas in Northern Mexico. Um, and it has a role there for uh, providing food for birds, for example. Um, could el eliminate or reduce uh, its potential as a new crop. Again, and it, it potentially, because of climate change, it has especially attractive properties in terms of drought tolerance and high seed, size, high seed production and high temperature uh, tolerance. And those could all be very attractive you know, in a climate changing world. Um, hybridization, as I said, you know, said with all the other examples, could spread this effect. We know that it can hybridize to other species of amaranth, some of which are also weeds, but some of which are food crops. 
or potential food crops. We really know nothing about how much it could hybridize with crops out of, or, or, um, out of its geographic range. Uh, so again, another theme that, you know, that comes up over and over again is the potential spread of these gene drives beyond the species that's originally um, uh, altered. And again, uh, this is a, an, an area that's rarely talked about, but um, it could further entrench an industrial system of agriculture that um, the use of, for example, herbicides um, to control this weed uh, that caused um, this plant to become a weed in the first place uh, or a serious weed in the first place could be further entrenched by re-energizing or um, the, the ability to use that herbicide by resensitizing it um, to the herbicide um, that, uh, it has, that this weed has become resistant to, glyphosate. Um, and because it's resistant to glyphosate, which is, was overused in the GMO system in the US, that is why this weed has become such a serious problem. And so if we resensitize it to glyphosate, we're basically just going back to a system that has caused numerous problems in and of itself. Um, as Ricardo mentioned, there's some general challenges to the development of gene drives. Oops. Um, Low rates of homologous recombination. I'm not going to, you know, I don't have time to elaborate on any of these, but um, weed seed banks. So weeds produce seeds that stay in the soil for a number of years. While they're there, you can't use, for example, the herbicide or a suppressive drive. Um, you, you can, uh, it, because those seeds um, will come up over time and will be selected for. For example, if you use an er the herbicide prematurely, um, though you'll eliminate the drive in the population by killing it because you've resensitized the weed, um, and, the, and the ones that are from the soil that are wild type will then take over. Um, uh, again, inability to, uh, to target, uh, to use the, so that goes to tar using the herbicide uh, for the years when the, uh, when the gene drive is spreading and the seeds are in the seed bank. Um, and again, off-site uh, alteration of the genome as with any other organism we're talking about. So I just wanted to quickly, again, this is just to point out um, that prior to the use of uh, this system of GMOs, uh, it was a, mi a pretty minor read. It was unranked uh, as a weed in corn and maize um, in that, as early as, as late as 1994, now seventh by 2009. It's probably higher now. In soybeans, it was 20, ranked 23rd as a weed. After the use of GMOs that selected for resistance in this weed, um, it rose to second in soybeans. Um, I would guess that, in, uh, I'm sure that in many parts of the country, it's first in cotton. I, I'm sure it's first as well. So it's really the system that created this. And while we might put a Band-Aid on, on it by using a gene drive, you're just really encouraging the further use of, 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 of system that causes problems in and of itself. This just shows the tr tremendous increase in the use of glyphosate that led to this problem in the first place that it, gene drives might, would be trying to address from very little to over 200 million uh, pounds. Uh, this is by, I think, 2013. We now, it's, it's up to over 300 million pounds in the US. Uh, one unintended problem, and this is the kind of thing we might have to worry about, uh, glyphosate was particularly good at killing the only food source of monarch butterflies, which have a major migratory pattern throughout the U.S. Midwest and reproduce in the Midwest. Um, and uh, there's been back and forth in the scientific literature about the actual cause, but I think it's pretty well established at this point. Uh, that glyphosate is, happens to be better than previous herbicides at killing the food source of monarchs, which were milkweeds. And in doing that is pretty much endangered uh, the, the monarch butterfly in the U.S. So again, one of these difficult to predict unintended effects. And importantly, uh, another important point I, I want to finally make is that um, we have alternatives in agriculture in particular, in all of these systems, we have alternatives. Um, we know that, for example, the use of cover crops, here's uh, rye, uh, an annual crop that's grown in the winter, suppresses weeds, it's mowed in the spring, uh, seeds are planted in these rows uh, by this planter between them, along with uh, low levels of tillage, um, you know, uh, have multiple benefits, these ecological approaches to agriculture, and work in terms of suppressing these weeds. 
um, but are not being adopted enough, uh, and this is a whole other discussion because of a favoring the industrial system. But I do want to point out work that has shown that these kinds of systems can actually have um, higher yield. This is multiple farm scale um, experiments, higher yield, much lower impacts on um, nutrient load, um, to environmental toxicity, um, herbicide use, and so forth. Um, on this inside track, the outside here is conventional um, industrial agriculture. So as you can see, um, a little higher labor use for these um, more robust, ecologically robust systems, but much less environmental impact and um, productivity is high and profits is high or higher than the industrial system. But again, systems like gene drives um, that, that reinforce uh, this, are, this kind of system are a problem. So I'm going to skip through a lot of this since I'm pretty much out of time and I'd be happy to uh, um, talk about questions. But for insects, um, very similar stories. Um, let me just back up for a second. Um, most are invasive species. Uh, we um, often biological controls can work if given the time. Um, again, we have this issue of potential opportunity costs that I mentioned earlier where, and I think um, Ricardo kind of alluded to it as well, where if we focus um, too much on the glitz of gene drives and ignore these other um, si um, ecological systems approaches, um, we have the possibility of further entrenching a whole system that is dysfunctional. And this is already the case. Um, the investment in these more ecologically sound agriculture systems in the U.S. has been found to be only 3 to 5 percent of what is already put into industrial systems. And I think the gene drive uh, approach can just further um, encourage that. Um, but, but again, complexity um, is, uh, in, in the systems is a way to, to deal with many of these problems. Uh, again, I'll skip over this. But most of this, most of the work that's been done has been on Drosophila melanogaster, which of course historically is the organism of choice for genetics going back over 100 years. But we know very little about the ecology of these insect species outside of, in, of agriculture systems. And again, uh, they, they exist outside of those systems. They have important ecological roles outside of those systems, and yet we know very little about them. Uh, let's skip over this. Um, I've talked about the alternatives a little bit. Uh, breeding is another one that's often not talked about enough. Um, these are just some of the impacts of the industrial agriculture systems. I'll skip over dead zones, loss of biodiversity, loss of uh, tropical forests, and so forth. None of these will be addressed by a piecemeal approach like gene drives. Um, I have to skip over the military uses, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I think the main point about military uses is often these gene drives can have dual uses. And so one of the motivations is to look at uh, defensive, uh, be, being defensive about with gene drives, anticipating that others might de may develop them. But unfortunately, that's just the flip side of potentially using them uh, um, in pernicious ways uh, against other societies. So in developing a defense, you're also, in a, in a sense, developing an offense. And as some have, have said, we really need to, uh, you know, to find ways um, outside of gene drives rather than looking at gene drives themselves to, to, to do that. Um, skip over some of these. And just finally, um, in terms of risk assessment, uh, I think there's a couple practical takeaways that we've seen, for example, from agriculture for widespread uses like GMO herbicide resistant crops, more recently for, oops, for neonicotinoids that have been used almost ubiquitously and have caused huge problems for pollinators and insect loss. Many of you have heard about losses of 75 to 80% of European insects, flying insects. That's, um, we don't know for sure, but that's largely due to habitat loss and probably pesticide use. Um, but a lot of the, um, what we know about this um, are very, uh, in some ways, subtle effects. It's not outright lethality to these beneficial insects like pollinators. It's trophic level effects. It's loss of immunity. There's sublethal effects that are very difficult to assess through traditional risk assessments. Um, and basically, um, the history that we have with both these widespread pesticides and GMOs, I think, show pretty clearly that in practice, in society as it actually exists, 
the likelihood of doing thorough risk assessments that we would need to address the challenges of gene drives is really a fantasy. And the cost and time required to do these, I mean, it's taken you know, more than a decade, dozens of scientists to sort out some of these problems, and we still don't have all the answers. So in practice, are we really, as a society, going to have the patience, de dedication, time, and so forth, even if possible, to do these risk assessments? And as was not mentioned, I was a risk assessor for, for the US Environmental Protection Agency in the 90s when we were evaluating genetically engineered um, crops in particular. I would say we really failed at that, and, and all the regulatory agencies have. And so what confidence can we have going forward? So you can, in conclusion, I, I would just say that, you know, probably um, we are certainly at a stage where there are way too many unanswered questions to go forward in any practical way with gene drives. And we really, because of the complexity and uncertainties that that uh, brings forward, um, we really feel that uh, a very strict um, interpretation of the precautionary principle should be used when going forward with gene drives. Thank you. <clears throat>